Welcome. Thank you for joining. We are thrilled to welcome you to this quarterly platform for industry experts to meet and discuss the risks, concerns, and best practices regarding lithium-ion batteries and e-mobility devices, safety standards, and compliance. A special note of thanks to the experts on our panel who have committed in being proactive to work in unison to determine what actions need to be taken and taking responsibility for such actions as both individuals and a group. The agenda for today has been posted in the chat. We have four topics to explore today that have been submitted by retailers in the industry at large, including de minimis reform, three class e-bike classification systems, achievable building policy and mandatory safety standards. We have speakers on the panel who have agreed to make presentations on each topic. And then following, we will take five questions from the audience for further discussion. At the conclusion of today, Mr. Jay Townley, Human Powered Solutions, will summarize the group discussion, providing insight and action items to move conversations forward. We welcome questions into the chat anytime throughout the forum today. We will not have time to answer all of them live, but our panel members, experts, will respond to some via the chat function as able. Please place your questions in the chat at any time. We do welcome them. With that, I will turn it over to Mr. Jay Townley for some remarks on the execution of today's event and the value of our collective minds coming united to move the industry forward. Jay? Thank you, Heather. Uh what Heather asked me to do was to uh, give you guys a, just a brief statement of why. Um, and the purpose of this bicycle industry e-bike safety and standards panel, as we've discussed it, is to create a safe and positive environment for our industry to become proactive relative to the situation and the opportunity, by the way, that has been created by the growth of micromobility and the use of lithium ion batteries for powering propulsion systems and to review and update proposed action items every quarter. The format, which is open to suggestions and also to change, is uh, put together so that everyone who, who wishes to will be given the opportunity to share thoughts, ideas, suggestions, all within the allocated time specified by the moderator, by Heather. Uh, and uh, she will do that for each question without interruption. Everyone else is asked to listen in a respectful and non-judgmental way with no negative uh, comments. There's no, re no, re no reason to have negative reactions. Please direct all comments that you have directly to the question or the issue, not to the comments made by other participants. All discussions will be summarized and proactive and constructive action items proposed for action by some or all of the attendees. The panel sessions will also be recorded. So participants and listeners can review the questions, the discussions, the suggestions, and the summary and resulting proposed proactive and constructive action items. I think I know all of you on the panel. Thank you for being here. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it back to Heather. Thank you very much, Jay. Okay, let's dive right in then to our first topic for exploration. The topic is on de minimis reform. The question is, how do we organize the bicycle industry to lobby Congress and the USTR to immediately close the de minimis loophole on all e-micromobility products and co conversion kits that contain high capacity lithium ion batteries, aftermarket replacement high capacity battery packs, and battery chargers without documentation of compliance to recognize safety standards. This is an excellent question, excellent topic. And with that, our speaker that will begin the conversation today is Leo Yermakov, Regulatory Compliance Director for SRAM. Leo? Uh, hi, everyone. Um, Heather is very gracious to call me a uh, speaker. I, I, I wouldn't... I, I wouldn't call myself a speaker because I don't have like a big presentation or anything, but I do have a, a few comments to make on this super important topic. topic. Um, my understanding from talking to a lot of experts in the industry and um, in the regulatory space that the there is absolutely no way that our industry can convince government 
to, um, to change the de minimis rule. We are too small comparing to the opposition. And the opposition includes uh, significantly larger and stronger corporations that been um, lobbying government to make sure that we don't just keep the de minimis, but actually increase it. Um, the the uh, way I hope this goes, based on you know the the fire issues in New York and some other places around the country and around the world, is that somebody will listen to the industry and allow us to not have de minimis for dangerous goods. I think this is a better um, better approach to focus on the issue at hand and the issue at hand that creates the fires, that creates the danger are the batteries. And if government agrees with industry and allows us to not have de minimis for batteries, this is a better, more focused um, way to handle it versus saying we would like not to have de minimis for any e-mobility or micro-mobility or whatever, whatever we wanna call it. So that's just kind of my two cents here. Um, also would be important to understand that, for example, in Europe, they are planning on canceling de minimis period. They see this as a benefit to economy and safety. Uh, UK is considered now uh, as well. And we know that some countries in Asia, for example, Korea, I looked, looked them up recently, their de minimis is in a couple of dollars. We have a significantly higher de minimis where you can bring uh, a full product uh, without, as Hazza mentioned, any kind of compliance or regulatory uh, paperwork documentation or testing. So those are just my couple of comments. Um, I see there's a question. Should I answer them right away, Hazza, or? You have time, yes, please, Leo, if you would, please. Okay. Um, dangerous goods normally, uh, I would be just a battery. Um, it's it's a definition kind of that comes from the um, international shipping requirements. So um, the the product that require, for example, safety data sheets to um, or danger dangerous goods paperwork in order to place the shipments would be the battery. Excellent. Thank you, Leo. Okay, with that, I will turn it over to our next presenter here. We have Maureen Thorson of Wiley Wren. Hi there, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, just making sure I sometimes have uh, technical difficulties with Zoom. Um, so I was asked to discuss the de minimis shipments program. So not sure how many of you guys are totally familiar with this, but uh, there's a federal statute, 19 USC 1321C, that authorizes customs to allow goods to come into the United States without any formal duty payment or formal customs entry procedures, so long as it's one package per importer per day, valued at $800 or less. So since the uh, de minimis threshold, which used to be $200 and was $200 for many years, since that was raised in uh, 2016, I believe, it's led to an explosion in direct to consumer sales of products manufactured abroad. Uh, the main beneficiaries have been footwear, apparel, mass retailers like Amazon, and to a lesser extent, tech startups that are selling you know, consumer electronic devices directly to consumers. So I understand there's been some real concern in the micromobility universe about this particular program being used to uh, bring goods into the United States that don't meet uh, safety standards or that are not compliant with the types of quality uh, standards that most manufacturers are uh, employing. And so questions have, have been raised as to, you know, is there any way to change uh, the federal law? Is there any way to change how customs administers the law so that it's no longer allowing micro mobility products to clear without these formal customs procedures or otherwise, you know, get it to a point where customs is no longer 
um, using the 321 program in a way that lets it funnel these types of imports into the country. So from a strictly legal perspective, since the, the federal statute basically authorizes customs to clear goods uh, up to $800 a day per person, but doesn't require them to do that, there's two ways to potentially proceed. One is to actually change the statute itself. The other is to have customs amend its regulations, which reflect that $800 limit, uh, or to lower the limit uh, uh, in the case of micro mobility products, or to lower the limit more generally. So my thinking is that if, if there was an attempt to limit the $800 threshold or limitation, um, lower it in general, you'll see a lot of pushback from retailers, footwear, apparel, some of those tech companies who are bringing in products or using it to ship products that are not really of interest to the micro mobility universe. You know, it, so that kind of very general uh, reduction in the value limit might be something where there's a lot of pushback. There'd probably be less pushback if the changes were limited to micro mobility products, though it's, you know, I wouldn't say there would be no pushback if there was uh, an effort to try and get the statute changed or customs regulations or customs interpretation of those regulations changed in such a way as to remove micro mobility products from the ambit of the current $800 a day limit. Uh, and that might be because uh, folks that are not shipping micro mobility products look at it as the opening salvo and some more general effort to lower uh, the duty limit or the value limit or otherwise reduce the applicability of the de minimis shipments program. Um, one way that that risk might be hedged against would be not to amend the statute or the customs regulations allowing for duty-free clearance and paperwork-free clearance of $800 a day shipments generally, uh, but push for some other statutory or regulatory change that takes micromobility products outside the scope of the program. So one way of doing this might be, for example, to create some kind of affirmative import declaration obligation for micro mobility products that requires formal entry clearance for those goods. So they just, they fall outside of the scope of the 321 program, but not because that program has been directly changed, but because there's been a specific change affirmatively put in place to formally require something as to micro mobility products. Um, the other uh, potential area of pushback I could see if there were efforts to limit the $800 a day value limitation, reduce it back down or otherwise take micro mobility pro products outside the scope of the 321 program is ironically from customs itself. Uh, customs could uh, raise the point with lawmakers or other folks who are trying to push for the agency to take micromobility products outside the scope of the program that they don't really have a great way of distinguishing low value one off shipments of these types of micromobility products from other goods that are already coming in under the 321 program. Uh, you know, customs has about 2 million shipments a day coming in <laughs> through these types of informal entry procedures in one-off packages and that's you know they're drinking through a fire hose and so they as you can imagine already have a great deal of trouble at trying to enforce existing import restrictions for shipments that are coming through the mail through 321 through informal entry clearance procedures and they've devoted increasing in, uh, agency resources to trying to police this area but not with you know they've not necessarily with a dent in the problem. You know, it's just such a big issue for them um, trying to police these areas and they may not want to add another thing to the pile of things they already have on their plate and that they don't feel that well equipped to do. Um, Maureen, we went ahead and uh, we hit the five minute limit. So there was lots of great feedback there. So thank you for that. Any other panel members? I see no open question. 
actually. What were the documented reasons for increasing the 200 to 800? Maureen, could you speak on that? Sorry there. So, you know, I think it was just because there's so much more e-commerce. Uh, you know, retailers had been pushing for this, uh, companies that really wanted to do these types of direct-to-consumer sales. And customs itself wasn't averse to increasing the limit because having shipments clear with these low-value shipments clear without formal entry processes, you know, so supposed to keep work down for customs, basically keep them from having to process formal entry paperwork for what are individually very low value shipments that are unlikely to have huge amounts of duty consequences. Uh, and, you know, so from customs perspective, it's one of those, you shouldn't spend a dollar to chase down a penny kind of issues where they're, you know, spending a lot of agency resources on paperwork for one-off low value shipments, increasing the value is supposed to or should have cut down on that work for the agency. Thank you for your feedback there. Um, we do have a question about a list of uh, e-bike suppliers that are carrying product liability, which I will answer in the chat. Any other forum members wish to speak on de minimis or add anything to the conversation at this point? You know, Heather, this is Ibrahim. Um, we're seeing the de minimis issue kind of touching so much more product categories than what's going on with uh, e-bikes or anything related to the to, to the bicycle sector. Uh, so I think there's an interest probably for uh, the trade associations, NBDA, People for Bikes, and so on, to maybe get with some of the other um, manufacturing trade associations and unions, as well as public interest organizations. And that can be a great group to then lobby Capitol Hill with uh, to say that, you know, look, uh, there's too many products that are entering either as uh, dangerous goods or either as counterfeits or either as some products that just are not getting the same level of scrutiny that the if the product had been you know made in domestically and and then domestically would have had to gone through. So uh, from from our side of U.S. Solutions, we've had a lot of um, concern about the increase of counterfeit goods as a result of the de minimis uh, and counterfeit uh, U.L. marks that come on a lot of products. So we do think that it's uh, important that um, the industry is not just look within the framework of uh, the e-bike or uh, bicycle industry, but uh, look beyond that and see that there's a common denominator happening for a lot of manufactured goods. Excellent, thank you for adding that. And I know you had a presentation. Is there anything else outside of that scope that you wanted to add there, Ibrahim, because you were speaker number three? That's everything at this point. No, no, I didn't have any presentation content, no. Okay. Anyone else on the panel, uh, any other experts wish to speak on this subject? Hey, Hi, Heather. Hi, Jeff. Jeff from Trek. I would just suggest to um, the age-old uh, solution of writing your representatives and getting everybody that you know to write your representatives. Um, it doesn't always induce a lot of action, but an individual letter does count to the lawmakers that could make the changes. So um, always a good option if, if you got the time to write those letters. That's an excellent suggestion. Any other insight from panel members to add to this? Okay, then I know Jay, you're taking notes to summarize the conversation. At the conclusion, we'll go to topic exploration number two then. Again, if you're listening, uh, please feel free to put any questions into the chat for the panel members. Uh, the second topic of exploration is around the three bike, three class e-bike classification system in place. Uh, that's in, in place in most states and questions if it's still relevant and best practice. The question goes on to with the proliferation of motorized vehicles that fall outside of the three classes yet are marketed and sold as e-bikes frequently with an incorrect or misleading classification number applied, would it make sense to evolve the model legislation by further defining the classes, excluding certain characteristics from allowing a product to be included in one of the three classes or by some other means that clarifies what an e-bike is versus a motorized vehicle? 
It's a great question. Uh, and I will turn it over to speaker number one, Leo, uh, Regulatory Compliance Director of SRAM once again. Thank you, Leo. Okay, um, this is another fantastic question um, for uh, those of us who are global manufacturers and uh, design and uh, deliver products to um, um, global market. We see the difference in, uh, in uh, interpretation of the classes. Uh, so the easiest comparison, obviously, what's been um, used in Europe uh, Pedelecs and speed Pedelecs, for example, versus the three classes in the United States. Both systems definitely have uh, flaws um, and could be improved. Um, my opinion on the three class system in the United States is that um, we definitely need a better way uh, defining, for example, something like a power limit when the the statement says is 750 watts it's it's not clear what it is or how it's measured um is that average is that maximum um and um to me uh, and i'm sure many of you have been on the trails and see what's what's uh, people are what people are writing um there's a uh, more e-bikes that i see on the trails whether paved or unpaved um that are definitely not in compliance um, with how these things are defined. Um, the, I, I notice people going really, really fast, definitely significantly faster than the, 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 the defined speed limit, and they also do not pedal. That means they're using a throttle, um, and um, it's, it's just simply not defined in the a, in a, in a class three system. Um, to me, definitely requalifying or specifying the, 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 the classes better will help, but I also see this is not going to address the issue. There's got to be some level of enforcement um, by authorities um, of how, the, um, how, how do we police this, right? How do we, how do we um, make sure that those um, systems that are simply dangerous are not going to end up on the trails. Um, without enforcement, I don't see this being fixed. Um, obviously, responsible manufacturers make sure that we comply with the rules. We make sure that um, we, we follow the law. We make sure that our systems are tamper-proofed. Um, I would say that you know, the, the, the responsible manufacturers are not the problem here. It's the, the less expensive systems that are whether coming on the de minimis or easy to tamper with. They, they um, definitely do not follow the existing classes, but also, as I said earlier, I think our classification does need to evolve to better define what, um, um, how do we test and qualify our system to those uh, specifications. Um, there was a question, are there any states that enforce the law? Um, you know, um, not too long ago, I was on a call that people for bikes put together where the few representatives from state of California were present. Um, I don't remember exactly the, the jurisdictions, but the, um, the I, I wouldn't say it's a chief of the police department for one of the cities in California was st stating that the e-bikes and e-mobility products are creating such a negative uh, attention from the public that they are starting to look into how to enforce it, but they also need help from the, you know, from, uh, from the industry and from the advocacy groups to make sure that they know what to look for. Uh, so there's a certain level of education is needed for the public, for the distribution uh, channels, and also for the enforcement that will be looking at that. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leo. Great question, Sharon. I appreciate that. With this, we'll turn it over to our second speaker for today on this topic, uh, Ibrahim Giuliani of UL Solutions. And again, we welcome any questions into the chat and we'll answer those after. Thank you, uh, Heather. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. 
Um, yeah, uh, didn't have a ton to add on this one uh, and really just tried to make sure that for all the questions, uh, you all provided something from our perspective. Uh, so that's why you, you'll hear from me a couple of times today uh, for those that are in, in, in listening to this panel. Um, one of the things we thought about when we think about the three class classification, um, first of all, I think the policymakers are not educated enough on the state of the market and the proliferation of the products. Leo mentioned what he's just saw uh, on a number of different uh, categories uh, as, as he was seeing products that were throttle based and seeing products that were going past speed limits that are uh, already defined. Uh, so there's gotta be a more uh, education for the policymakers. Um, as our organization being a safety organization, we of course want to see and promote uh, safety for all users in the, that utilize equipment, uh, and whether it be multiple users or uh, e-bike riders or, or other types of uh, vehicles that are on the road, that everything work in harmony with each other. Um, but I think uh, you know specifically on the regulation of a device, it's better to understand scope of what the regulators are, are putting up as regulations, whether it's NISTA or CPSC and then determine where the gaps are and then provide them the insights so that they understand, okay, this area actually falls under your purview uh, to, to NISTA or this area falls under your purview to CPSC so that they can make better uh, understanding from the regulator standpoint. Uh, so twofold, educate the lawmakers, have them understand what's happening. And then second fold is to help the regulators, you know, understand what's falling under their purview. Excellent. Thank you for that feedback. I appreciate that. I see another panel um, member with an addition here, and then we'll get to a question after. Uh, Larry Peasy from Alta Cycling Group. Hi, Heather. Thanks so much. Um, I just wanted to uh, clarify, because I think it's often uh, confused, that the three-class system was developed um, to help regulate use at the state, local, and municipal level and didn't have anything to do with um, the CPSC or NHTSA guidelines for importing uh, a, a vehicle like a low-speed electric bicycle. Um, when we started to work on uh, state laws that would um, regulate e-bikes or a low-speed electric bike as defined uh, under 1512, um, we came across objections from various constituents, from advocacy groups, from community groups, and from law enforcement, because they were concerned. They always defaulted to worst case scenario and a, a, a speed pedelec or a, a, what we call a class three bike that has the ability to uh, travel at speeds of 28 miles an hour before the power cuts off. Uh, they just didn't seem um, to be accepting of that kind of vehicle on normalized bike infrastructure, but they were okay with that kind of vehicle on, you know, on on pavement or on a roadway with an adjacent bike lane. Uh, and counter to that, um, there was a lot of concerns from uh, off-road organizations and community groups that manage trail networks and public lands that a throttle actuated bike would be problematic on uh, because of environmental impact reasons. So that, that was the premise be behind the three classes. And I just think it's important to understand that that was to help uh, municipalities and states regulate use, didn't have anything to do with uh, uh, first sale or import into the United States as a low speed electric bicycle. Thank you for that, Larry. Um, for our, our forum members, we do have a question here um, from John Robinson in Ohio. The question is, with manufacturers shipping bikes as class two, but with the capability to change it to a class three, has there been any discussion on what class these bikes actually fall in, or has there been any industry discussion on defaulting them to a lower class to the lower class three, given the bike has the capability? Great question. Any of our panel members who can speak to this? Uh, Larry, I see your hand up again, so uh, we'll just go right back to you. Thank you. 
Yeah, thanks. Um, there has been discussion about it. Actually, um, when People for Bikes met with um, the CPSC earlier in the, in the year, this subject came up. And um, I think we'll see uh, this addressed in updated um, regulations um, in the you know in the future. I don't know how long it's going to take, but there is an awareness that that it's a problem if um, you know people uh, mark a product as class two, but it has class three or higher speed capabilities. Um, and I do believe that this will be a, be addressed, but uh, you know, none of this happens quickly or as quickly as we'd like it to. Excellent, and I appreciate the quick response from our panel members. It's very hard sometimes to get a question on the spot like this. Um, we had another question come in relating to the legal age to ride an e-bike, specifically in Florida. Um, but I, I think, could anyone speak to the legal age to ride an e-bike class one to three? Anyone on the panel ever have that, any panel ever have that knowledge right at your fingertips? I'll know I appreciate the work that people of bikes, uh, people for bikes have done recently with the uh, education for consumers on e-bike safety. And we can put a link to that in the chat as well. Any other questions or feedback from our panel members or from our attendees on this topic? Excellent. Okay, let's move to set, uh, our third topic of exploration, uh, specifically saving time for the next two topics, our third and fourth today. I say we have met multiple speakers. This one is around commercial and multifamily building owners and management companies, at least in New York City, trying to figure out how to address the issue of e-bikes. Not all e-bikes or other e-mobility devices have the same risk profile and the manner of use charging impacts that risk profile. Not all building owners know the nuisances of the issue, and in the absence of clear guidance on what is good and achievable building policy for e-bikes, uh, some are simply banning e-mobility altogether. What organizations or entities are best positioned to help building owners know what to do uh, to disseminate this information, and what can the bicycle industry do to provide information and support to municipalities? Fantastic questions that we, we would love to see the e-bike uh, side of our industry continue to thrive. This topic was presented by Don Miller from New York City Hall. And Don, I'll have you just kind of introduce the topic a little bit more, if you would, and share some additional resource to get the conversation going. Sure. Thanks very much. And thanks for having us at this event. Um... I'm actually joined um, in our participants um, by colleagues from our Department of Transportation, our Economic Development Corporation, our Fire Department. Um, it's a really big focus um, for a lot of us across New York City government. And um, and you know we're we're supportive of the growth of electric micromobility. New York City is a fabulous place for people to get around this way. Um, but one of the the troubling things we're seeing is um, is buildings that don't know what to do, um, don't see a model they should look for, something that seems possible for them. And so trying to err on the side of caution, they just might ban it altogether, um, which isn't an outcome that we want. Um, you know, I think there's, we do have um, some fire codes in place, um, but those apply to um, places where you're storing like five or more devices in one place. So more like a or like a business type setting. Um, and I think, um, you know, there are people out there, um, I think Heather, you may have put me in touch with um, Bikes Make Life Better who have provided some ideas for maybe almost what like an ideal super safe bike storage room might look like with lots and lots of bells and whistles and thick walls and all that stuff, um, which I think is great for, for buildings that have the type of space and resources for that type of thing. but um, there's all types of buildings around New York City who are dealing with this, many of which don't have the space or resources for kind of that ideal solution. So, you know, this is something I kind of ask at everyone I can is is sort of, you know, what would be a sort of, um, you know, a an achievable um, an achievable um, policy around e-bikes that does increase their safety, does cause residents. Um, 
to make the right choices, um, you know, but is something that they can achieve. Um, you know, we are also having conversations um, with the insurance industry because that is one factor here is is what insurers um, start to charge for, for people to use space in different ways. So um, hopefully that provides just a little more color to sort of, um, you know, what I'm looking to do here is I just love to, for, for a building owner who gets a concern to know, okay, like, for my for my type of building, here would be some model policies or model interventions that that I could that I could do. Excellent, thank you for the background, Don. Uh, we're going to go ahead. We do have several for, uh, forum members who are going to speak to this, and we'll begin with Eric Fredrickson, Vice President Operations, Call to Recycle. Eric, thank you, Heather. So, Don, really, uh, really pleased to have folks from the city participating in the call. Um, I think that New York is dealing and struggling with this topic specifically um, more so than than many other municipalities. The the infrastructure associated the infrastructure in New York and and the um, just the build of the city make it such that it that e-bikes are a really fantastic way to for residents to get around. Um, as there are a number of folks, including the Equitable, Equitable Ride Project, um, are quick to say um, bicycles and in particular e-bikes are not just a they're not just about riding on trails and they're, they're not fun. It's a it's a it, it's a means of social mobility and a way for people to have access to jobs and a way to get to jobs. Um, so the, the last thing that any of us want, and the last thing that we need is for people to just start putting prohibitions on the use of e-bikes. And, and it's not about growing an industry. Um, the, the fire codes are probably, our, our comment on this is that the fire codes are probably the most nimble way for local jurisdictions to make changes to the behavior that impacts the specific needs of their area. Um, we've talked some about federal regulations in the CPSC, which is oftentimes a multi-year regulatory cycle. But the 2022 fire code that you started to mention some, Dawn, that makes some changes to charging in commercial spaces did also start to have some prohibitions for residents charging commercial e-bikes and e-bike batteries in residential dwellings. So two comments on that. They can be changed quickly. They can be changed in a way that is specific to the community in which they are impacting. And also they can have an impact on not just commercial, but on residential dwellings as well. One of the things that we're challenged with is that as quickly as the problems are evolving, the answers are evolving as well. And, and so we think that it's problematic to want to paint with too broad a brush and be too prescriptive about what the answers are. Um, there is there is one sentence of language in Section 309 of the New York Fire Code, which regulates charging of micro mobility, mobility devices, and it's the term unless otherwise approved by the department. And we think that there's a lot of ability for New York City in particular to be nimble, but other jurisdictions and, and cities that are impacted by language like that, unless otherwise approved by the department, there are um, there are well established processes for seeking um, departmental level approval through the technical management office of FDNY to get approval for installations of specific pieces of equipment that meet specific needs. And the need of a consumer charging a battery in their residence is very different from the need of a building owner who has a room with a lot of batteries being charged in it. And both of those are problems that need to be addressed. We're really going to keep everybody safe. I think we're at 14 deaths in New York City just this year. So, you know, while you know, I'm a member of the technical committee for UL and we're working on a battery charging solutions, but that's that's a consensus process that takes quite a while and it may not serve the specific needs that, of every user in the community. And so I would really encourage local jurisdictions to take control through fire codes um, in ways that allow for flexibility of solutions. And, and as I said, having established pathways for getting department level approval for engineered solutions they can meet the needs whether it's one person charging a, a battery in a in a sleeve in or a box or whatever type of solution somebody builds all the way through to something with 50 e-bike batteries charging all next to each other one of the things that i do want to mention is kind of a problematic caveat to it though 
is I see solutions online advertised as safe charging solutions. And most of the people on this call have burned e batteries, including e-bike batteries. There is not a $20 solution on the market that is physically capable of containing the thermal energy from a burning e-bike battery. And so I think that there is needs, there aren't, there is a need for standards in the intermediate and long term um, because there are so many products on the market that just cannot possibly do what they purport to do. Um, but it, I think it's through fire codes and through those pathways to say, here's the problem, go engineer a solution, demonstrate that it works. And then insurers and building owners can start to obligate things that have approval by the department. Excellent. Thank you so much, Eric. That was a very thorough uh, analysis and presentation and really appreciate your insight there. Uh, we'll have a, we're going to keep it going. Our next presenter on this topic, um, Leo, uh, which director of SRAM, uh, once again, will comment here as well. Leo. Um, I am very much in agreement with what Eric just said. Um, it's, it's a very complex issue. Um, and um, we at SRAM did a global research of what's available in what country in terms of the um, safe uh, battery uh, charging and bike charging. And I can tell you that um, USA is not the only country that does not have good direction here. Uh, of course, we can look at the fire codes and all of that, but it becomes complicated in uh, all the buildings in the, uh, you know, tight spaces. Um, the, um, what I am seeing in, um, in Europe and Australia, for example, is that insurance companies are stepping up and creating uh, requirements, especially for old buildings and historic buildings. Um, it's not across the board. It's not, um, it's not really, um, um, I would say repeatable because it's kind of unique to each situation, but it's definitely the uh, the driving force at the moment. Um, the um, the other thing that we also noticed um, when we would let's say rebuild the the new office or create a new building for ourselves is that the local fire departments really really get interested in what's being done in terms of storing batteries and preparing the e-bike charging stations. Um, so again, insurance companies and the local fire departments, fire chiefs were the organizations that we would rely on to give us the guidelines uh, whether we are doing the right thing ourselves and what we're advising, let's say, our customers to do. Um, the, the question of what starts the batteries or what causes the battery fires that Don kind of elaborated on uh, in the beginning to open this discussion. This is really complex, charged, and political. Um, I, I hear a lot of different um, interpretations of what happens. And I, I don't think it's good for this particular panel to go into really technical conversation of what can cause the battery fire and, and how, it, how it happens. But um, to me, I think it's, it's a, it's important for us as an industry to solve and make sure that we don't see the, the statistics, the negative statistics that we see in New York. Excellent. Thank you, Leo, for your expertise and for speaking on all of our four topics today. I really do appreciate that. Uh, we'll continue this conversation and uh, turn it over to Ibrahim Giuliani of UL Solutions, who will present as well. Yeah, I just want to this is a topic probably the most uh, at the heart of what I wanted to talk about for this um, panel. Um, first of all, I, I really appreciate the comments from both uh, Leo and from Ed, uh, I think, I'm sorry, from Eric. And I think both have had um, the insights into knowing some things around first, the product safety of it, you know, looking at a product and ensuring that it's met requirements and it's, and it's been compliant and demonstrated um, that it, you know, has been evaluated and tested and certified to the appropriate standards, but also then to think about the bigger framework of fire protection, which is, you know, uh, each municipality needs to look at their scenario and situation and take into account those types of situations and scenarios to then determine 
uh, you know, beyond the product having, you know, demonstrated uh, itself to a safety standard, what else needs to be done? So I think one of the things that, you know, we look at at UL Solutions is that educating the landlords and property owners on the hazards is, is the first step. They should know what the hazards are, uh, not just about explosion and fire, but, you know, um, hazardous materials and, and some of those things related to lithium technologies. Uh, they should be educated on the unsafe charging practices, uh, things that would cause, uh, you know, charging to be a little bit uh, uh, considered unsafe, like to charge outdoor when you're using an indoor charger, uh, using the wrong charger, you know, stacking a bunch of chargers together and connecting a bunch of e-bikes in the, in the same proximity of each other, um, about the limits of the battery storage cabinets and, and understanding that. And, and, and Eric mentioned, you know, there is a document being worked up that he's on the technical committee for UL outline, uh, I'm sorry, UL 1487, uh, which is going to try to address battery storage cabinets and, and their explosion and fire ratings. Uh, and then for the uh, actual products, the e-bikes, e-scooters, or other micromobility devices, uh, that everything in that in the spectrum of micromobility uh, have their safety certification to the appropriate safety standards. Uh, things like the uh, software of the battery management system, the software of the e-bike e motor control has to be avail uh, evaluated by technical experts to know that it's partitioned off the uh, critical safety functions away from uh, those functions that could be uh, altered by uh, a user or a rider, uh, and as well as all the evaluation of the materials and components that build up the system. All of that has to be checked to make sure that it, it's, a, it's a compliant system. Um, and we also think that the, you know, as, as mentioned by Eric, the fire service, how you engage with folks, not just in the local proximity of, F, uh, of Fire Department of New York City, but also the International Association of Fire uh, Chiefs, the International Association of Fire Fighters, uh, the National State Fire Marshal, uh, as well as the National Fire Protection Association. Those are all really important organizations of the fire service, as well as uh, of the codes themselves that NFPA, you know, is the one who publishes the National Fire Code, as well as the National Electrical Code, uh, and getting them involved in, in discussing these issues and, and getting them to look at what their, uh, what, you know, what their needs are and, and what they want to see addressed. And then, you know, addressing the codes that come out from uh, uh, the NFPA, a lot of those codes, uh, whether they be the fire code, electrical code, or building code, or residential code, they are adopted by municipalities across the United States and, and abroad. So uh, getting th those topics into the codes is really important to, to then specify what's needed for uh, certain scenarios or certain situations. Um, now, one other thing I, I would like to share, and I think this might be news for some of our panelists as well, there's a bill in California, SB 7112. Um, one of the things about this bill is that's interesting is that it's going to say to the landlords uh, that you know they're not gonna be allowed to tell their tenants uh, to, to say that they can't store or charge a micromobility product uh, on their lease property if the uh, product has demonstrated some form of compliance. And the issue is the, the definition of, of what compliance is is very broad and very loose. And so when someone says, oh, I'm compliant to the UL standard, uh, unless it's gone through you know, accredited testing organizations, uh, folks that have been approved by uh, entities like the uh, OSHA National Recognized Test Laboratory Program and have the scope of recognition of those standards, there's not a, you know, that, that's as formal as it gets in terms of who's approved to do the certification work. And if uh, a bill becomes a law that just says you just need to be compliant, that's really no different than some of the existing statutes that are out there today where, it, which cause some of the, the issues that we see today which is that you know people would say just you know a regulator or, or some type of entity would say just be compliant to a particular safety standard, and then that compliance was left to be self-declared or um, done through non-certification organizations uh, just by test laboratories, uh, and that doesn't demonstrate compliance to a safety standard since there's so much more engineering and and other principles that go into the evaluation of the product. Um, generally speaking, a UL safety standard is one third or less test requirements. Two thirds or more have to do with material components, uh, construction requirements, design requirements. It's all about the engineering principles of how the product is being designed and ensuring that that's in compliance to what the safety requirements are. So I just wanted to share that uh, as a final comment about um, things that are happening and, and kind of getting to what Don was asking beyond just New York, thinking about what's happening in other parts of the country as well.
Really appreciate that. And it's nice to have that, um, that bigger picture view. Thank you so much. Um, we have some questions coming in and we'll get to those, but let's do, we have one more presenter on this topic. So we'll go through our final presentation and then we'll answer questions after. So I have Ron Butler um, who will present now. Um, he has some slides to share. He is with Energy Storage Safety Products International. Ron, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Heather. I wanna first make sure that you can see my screen and you can hear my voice. Yes, sir. Absolutely, thanks for the time. Um, so I wanna introduce you to Concept. Uh, my company is funded by the United States Department of Transportation, FIMSA, as well as an, uh, the DOD to develop real world hard and soft tech solutions to these problems. So we've morphed into an organization that is designing and developing uh, uh, on the basis of research uh, solutions for the battery fire issues. So we know the problems. I'll go through this very quickly. This is not something that's foreign to anyone on this call. Um, so what are the solution sets that are available now? Well, we charge our batteries outside. The move is to make sure that batteries are charged outside, at least that uh, as a cursory movement uh, as a solution set. But the problem is there's no monitoring. There's no way to physically mitigate and control. Uh, there's no alert uh, uh, notification concepts. There's no ability to communicate failure to an interested third party, uh, a, a, a homeowner or an apartment uh, uh, owner. Uh, but what we're, And there's certainly no way to enclose these things. Now, there have been efforts in the city of New York, most particularly on the part of New Lab and DOT, to come up with some pilot programs uh, to provide solution sets. Uh, we have found some challenges in, in that. And we would like to propose better solutions. And these are real world because I think a lot of folks on this call uh, want to know more about uh, you know, the solutions, what we could recommend uh, from a policy perspective, but also what does the tech look like? So our, our primary funder is the US Department of Transportation, FIMSA. Um, their goal is to come up with those real world solutions. They were not concerned necessarily with what the policy looks like. What they wanted us to do is do some research, come up with some solutions, whether they're the right solutions or not on the front end, but at least explore what the solution sets look like. As part of that multi-phase, multi-year project, um, we specialize in designing battery transport and storage systems and charging systems, all with safety in mind. So what we came up with is the Battery Logistics Integrated Safety System. Uh, this is just one example of what of our, our Bliss systems look like. They provide safe indoor, outdoor safe charging. And what I mean by that is I can move my battery charging outdoors, but at the same time, keep it inside, away from inclement, uh, inclement weather, um, and control the fire risk issue. The solution sets that we've seen so far would have us move the battery charging outside and safety almost does not come into play at all. So there's no monitoring or detection. There's no fire or toxic gas control. And I think the thesis is if we move it outside, we don't have, at that point, we don't have to worry about these things. That is absolutely not the case. What FIMSA in particular has charged us with doing, no pun intended, is coming up with the detailed solution sets uh, that might offer, um, you know, some uh, uh, ease of issue for bike shop owners, for apartment building owners, et cetera. So why do we do it? And what is the value proposition? Um, we want to reduce risk, of course, but that does not just mean moving it outside. Um, what other uh, components can we add to a systems approach that allows us to not only do that, to move it outside of a building, but also offer something to the people we attempt to serve? For example, a bike shop owner. Um, how do we uh, leverage reusable seat containers? How do we uh, develop systems that allow the, uh, your charging process, even storage processes to be moved outside, remain inside, so to speak, and allow the bike shop to, uh, owner to make some money off of it, to reduce insurance? Uh, what are the metrics that the system like, like this? And this not, again, is not the perfect system. Uh, what are the sustainable metrics that uh, we can look to to help the bike shop owner in this case? 
Uh, we can do charging, we can do battery recycling, we can include a swapping center. Um, what do we get out of this? We get 24 seven monitoring, we get toxic gas control, venting, fire suppression systems, detection notification, and the ability to move all of this again outside. So I wanted to show you some of the renderings of one of our systems that's under construction right now. This is part of the system that represents uh, charging lockers. Uh, Eric brought up some, some things that are very important. Uh, these have to be vetted. These have to be tested. Uh, these have to be built uh, for a specific environment, removable batteries in this case, or rack charging. And again, what we want to do is give you a visual representation for those who are seeking that of what something a solution set might look like. So what we can do is take these and they're completely mobile, drop them down in a cityscape in New York City, for example. Uh, we are already doing a pilot, uh, moving towards a pilot in the city of Detroit with the Detroit Fire Department and some funders here, uh, which represents a reasonable platform to do some of this test and demonstration. But this is what one might look like. Completely movable, I can drop in place, and uh, it can be used in front of a business in a parking lot, what have you. Additional renderings of what this might look like. What you're seeing in this picture here, if you can see my cursor, is a battery drop-off for recycling. And again, all of these are tied into safety systems from venting, pressure relief, fire suppression, and communications technology. So um, the way we look at this is, is pretty straightforward. Um, it's uh, uh, multi-pilot projects should be jumping off in New York City, Detroit, and hopefully Seattle. We're waiting for them to come on board. We are inviting some pilot partners. If anyone on this call is interested in working with us, we would love to have you to talk more about it and potentially uh, jump off a pilot in your city. Um, quick and to the point, of course, I stand by for questions and support. And uh, there's my contact information. Feel free to reach out to me at any time. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ron. Uh, love to see the images and the share of the work you're doing. Uh, I'm going to turn it over now. We had a couple questions that came in. Uh, we have a question here that says, I hear battery cabinets mentioned for bike shops to help mitigate potential risks. Is anyone discussing fire resistance battery bags as an option? Can anyone on our panel member of experts address this question? I think Eric brought that up earlier. I, they're available. I, I'm not a big fan. I, you know, there are better solutions, I think, not only available today, but certainly those that are coming to fore. Um, but I, you know, I'm just not a big fan of them. That's Thank personal. you, Rob. Uh, Eric, I see yeah. your hand. Yeah, I, um, you, you know, I, I, this is a small community. And and a lot of us know each other and have, have worked with each other um, in a in a couple of different spaces. You know, I know I know Ron quite well. And while I'm not going to speak for him, my guess on why he's not a fan of them is that typically they don't work. And so you're, you know, and you, so what you're doing is you're taking something that is by by raw numbers a low likelihood outcome. Right. The, the, the fires that we've seen, it's not from a plurality of devices or from even a even a large percentage. It's from a fraction of a percent of devices. So what you're basically doing is you're saying this is probably not going to happen anyway. So let me sell you something to make you feel better about something that's probably not going to ha happen and hopefully doesn't happen, because if it does happen in a worst case scenario, it's not going to work. And, and so that's why I think that there's there's strong reticence to support things like battery charging bags. Um, Call Recycle has been working with um, with a partner organization called Cellblock for a couple of years. And Cellblock started about six months ago endeavoring to try and build a bag. And with the idea being that it had to be cost effective enough to actually get into the hands of the, the rider and user community. And They've gone through 11 failed test prototypes, keeping it as inexpensive and, and 
and accessible as possible. And just the energy involved presents one problem after or one challenge after another, after another. So just the volume of gassing means that you tear threads apart. So then you're talking about adding the costs associated with off-gassing and venting control and mitigation. Then once you once you get the bag to hold together, it's so hot on the inside that even if the bag itself doesn't melt, now the fabric or the strings melt. And so then you have to upgrade to steel stitching. And so this is just an incredibly complex engineering challenge to make a charging bag. Um, I, I, they've now tested and contained, Ron, just so that you're aware. Subblock has tested and contained a thousand watt hour battery NMC cells, new cells, hundred percent state of charge. So, so we're talking about a big e-bike battery, not a conflated test, and they've been able to contain it. But it's, but it's a ultimately the the retail price of such a, a bag is going to be a couple hundred dollars just because of the materials and the fabrication involved. So, is it a perfect solution? No. Does it work? Yes. So, you know, there's no one answer to these solutions. What Ron presented is a great idea, but on a per battery, per bike cost uh, basis, there's a lot of cost involved in that as well. So there are bags, there are people working on the bags. I, I would just, right now, there's, um, this is a buyer beware type of, of market when it comes to battery safety devices. And it's unreasonable to expect a consumer to burn a thousand dollars, six hundred, eight hundred dollar battery just to make sure that something works. Um, so there's definitely an opportunity for industry to to get behind products that that um, are peer reviewed and independently tested and are demonstrated to work. Excellent, thank you, uh, Ron. Did you have something to add there as well? Very quickly, I couldn't agree more with Eric. I always agree with Eric. Uh, he's always on point with these with these issues. Um, very quickly, this the what I propose is is um, is based largely on support from organizations like state, local, and federal governments. Um, they have to be invested. It's 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 quantifiably unfair, and I will pick on the e-bike or the or the bike industry. Uh, it's quantifiably unfair to make to put all of this weight on their shoulders. Um, there has to be participation and financial support from state, local, and federal organizations. And there, there is. I think there's a willingness to do so. Um, this has to be shared and uh, cannot be uh, a burden bear, uh, borne only by uh, organizations like e-bike retailers. Excellent. Thank you, Ron. And you know, we're discussing our third topic uh, of exploration, which is building policy, uh, also refers to retailers. And uh, we do have Brian Hawkins from Fixture Lab on the call, who I know has been working on this as well to advise retailers. Brian, would you add anything from a retailer stand standpoint and what you're doing? Hello, everybody. It's great to be here. You can hear me, right? Yep. Okay, good. Um, I'm... I don't know that I have that much to add at this point to the conversation, but I, I have a very, I'm very invested in the topic because we design all manner of retail stores all around the country, mostly in the outdoor categories, uh, lots and lots of bike shops. Um, and I wanted to offer myself up as a resource for this very valuable panel of people here because I know I've literally helped hundreds of bike shops around the country design their spaces. I'm going to be dealing with this topic, have been dealing with it, and will be dealing with it in a much bigger way in the future and helping to design solutions that work for those retailers. I know the retailers very well. I know the limitations of the average and the not average stores all around the country. I know how to support bike product in terms of fixturing and storage and how much room everything takes down to the inch. So I feel like I'm a good, valuable resource, and I would just like to let you guys know that I'm there, um, and I would love to participate. However, uh, anybody here would like participation from that kind of a perspective. Thank you, Ryan. And I see Ed Benjamin, uh, Light Electric Vehicles, has his hand up. Ed, did you have something to add? I wanted to, first of all, several of the speakers have had really excellent information to share. Thank you for that. Uh, I'd like to, 
comment on the firebox. We just heard a really knowledgeable uh, explanation of fire bags, but I think that fire boxes are perhaps a more intuitive solution for the bike shop and you can buy them for as little as 300 bucks. And I wanna make sure that there are two, two points I like to make. One is it will probably keep your store from catching on fire. That's good. It will not stop the fumes. You need to get the hell out of the building. That's bad. <laughs> so just that just adds a contribution. Fire boxes, some good, some bad, but it may stop your fire. This may stop the fire from burning your building down. What are, what are you? What are we? What are we referring to as a fire box? A, uh, a it, yellow cabinet. Yeah, a yellow fireproof cabinet that has an automatic closing lid. Uh, there's usually yeah, I, there are some that have ventilation systems built into them, but that's not what bike shops will buy. They'll buy the three hundred dollar a box where the lid will come down when the I, temperature gets up. Yeah, I would I would just caution anybody in the user community from again a false sense of security. I, I've seen with my own eyes a Tesla's worth of energy inside a yellow flammables cabinet that was designed to keep the fire out of the box, not the fire in the box. So those yellow yellow flammables cabinets, you put flammable things in the cabinet so that if your building has a fire, the gasoline that's inside it doesn't ignite. And, and I would really caution, um, they're not tested, intended or designed for keeping the type of energy that, that we're talking about inside. Um, and, and I'll let Ibrahim say a little bit more because this starts to fall squarely into the UL kind of space. You know, th things are listed for specific uses and, and I would be careful to make sure you're getting something that is intended to be used, how a bike shop is going to be using it. Excellent. Thank okay. you, Eric. Yep, Ibrahim. Oh, thank you. Thank you both, Eric and Heather. Uh, this was a great comment, Ed. And I encourage if you're not already on the uh, UL 1487 technical committee, look to submit an application for that. Uh, you know, UL's st standards and engagement, the parent company of UL Solutions is always uh, looking to get everybody in the stakeholder mapping to be involved in standard development. Uh, and this is such an important topic that it does need the best and brightest minds uh, to, to uh, figure out what can be done to contain lithium ion batteries and various types of lithium ion batteries uh, from going into a state of explosion that goes beyond the cabinet. Uh, and that's the goal that everyone's been trying to get to. I, I've been involved in this topic since 2016 when it was getting involved, when, when ComEd was trying to do it for energy storage projects, uh, products. So this is not an, uh, a new topic and it is evolving uh, over the last uh, seven, eight years. Um, however, you know, now is the time with this kind of work going on for UL 1487 to get involved, uh, to participate, to, if you have uh, science and uh, uh, some research to share, to share that. Because I think from what I've seen over the years, and, and the claims have been many, and the failures have been equally many, that uh, products can go through uh, some level of uh, fire propagation, and as a result of a propagation starting that the the cabinet or containment uh, product would be able to keep it contained. And more often than not, uh, it really has not gone that way. And part of the reason I think is um, most of the cabinets are trying to be very generic and say that anybody's product can go into their cabinet and rather than specify very specific chemistries or specify very specific products uh, because you know the deflagration hazard the way fire uh, will behave or gases will accumulate uh, do change per the product and its chemistry. Uh, and so all of that is part of the fire protection engineering that goes on uh, that needs to be part of uh, any of the standards that are there for uh, containment, suppression, uh, as well as other uh, fire protection topics. So it has been quite a challenge and you know UL has not wanted to wait to have some kind of requirements, but it's extremely complex and it's also very uh, problematic for anyone to go out there making the claims that they're making without having had, uh, you know, had some real, uh, you know, evaluation criteria and uh, or clear market claims as to what the product can and can't do. So uh, that's from my side, from what I've seen over the years. And, you know, I'm 18 years in with UL. Uh, my father is a 40 year customer. So I've seen UL throughout my entire life. And, um, you know, this is just one of those topics that it we're, we're putting our 
top technical talent on it uh, every single day. Excellent. Thank you. And we have one minute left here. I'm going to turn it over to Leo. Leo, I'm sure you're responding to this. And then also I have a I have one other question I need to ask you too on the CE label that was asked by one of our guests. So I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just want to kind of um, highlight that we started this conversation with a question about a regular user and residential area. And then we switched to the bike shop and businesses. I think those two are very different um, scenarios, right? What is done at the business level, there are, uh, let's call them uh, good practices that should be followed. And as as an example, right, don't leave your bikes or batteries plugged in overnight when nobody's at the bike shop, right? Don't charge your batteries all the way to 100% and leave those, uh, you know, unattended. Uh, there is a reason why IATA and some other transportation requirements state do not move the batteries with the state of charge more than 30%, right? So there's some good practices that businesses can and should follow that not necessarily possible for the residential areas. Um, so I think those are two very different questions that as an industry we should answer and need to answer. But I just wanted to highlight that, you know, we, we started one way and we finished the other way. Um, so um, it, it's obviously what we can do in the, in the bike shop and not charge the batteries all the way is not practical for the user who wants the bike to be charged overnight while they sleep so they can use it in the morning to go to work. Um, so the, 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 the situation are very different there. Um, and in terms of cabinets, I know there's a lot of expertise here I can tell you that from our research, um, we can see that um, you know there's a whole bunch of things out there, whether with self-extinguishing walls or some other uh, issues. There is a reason why, for example, in Europe, um, the cabinets are rated for 90 minutes. And so if there is a battery, battery fire inside the cabinet, that it's supposed to contain the fire for 90 minutes, and then it's expected that the fire department will be on site to handle it. Um, so. None of the cabinets are, I think, in my opinion, at the moment, are perfect uh, to contain the fire indefinitely. Um, I might be wrong, but this is what our research shows. And again, those are the cabinets that the businesses can use. If you are live in an apartment in New York and you want to charge your e-bike, that is not the solution that you're going to go after because those are really expensive products to purchase. And Leo, there's a question, what is the CE label worth? Can you quickly address that? Um, in the United States, not much. But the CE mark is the self-declaration uh, mark that is required in Europe. Um, the self-declaration is hopefully a result of the third party testing by um, 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 you know, the, the independent test lab. Um, the... the um, there's a certain market surveillance and the uh, customs uh, questions that could come up to uh, address why CE mark on the product and whether it was justifiably applied. In United States, CE mark is just a decorative symbol that has no value. Excellent, thank you. And I see some additional comments in the chat. Uh, quickly, before we move to our fourth topic, I see that Kunal from Bosch eBike Systems can speak to the question or the statement from Allison about including people with access needs in this conversation. Kunal, would, would you add there? Uh, sorry, no, my comments were for CE label. I have no comments for the access needs topic. Excellent, thank you. I think it's a, a fantastic point to put out, Allison, and I appreciate that. Uh, with that, we will move to our fourth topic of exploration. I appreciate the great uh, content on that third topic. Uh, this one is uh, reads such as, my understanding is that without an act of Congress, the CPSC process for creating mandatory safety standards will take a long time. In light of that, what's the best way to accelerate safe and regulated devices in US markets and to prevent further uh, prolification of uncertified devices. 
Um, some examples could be pushing for an act of Congress, pushing state and local. Uh, Don Miller, again, from New York City Hall is here. She presented this question and I'll ask her just to uh, shed some more light on this. Sure, thank you, Heather. Um, I think I think most people on this call know, um, actually starting uh, on Saturday, New York City's um, local requirement that any device sold or rented in the city has to be um, tested by a lab, but uh, rec nationally recognized testing lab to be certified to the applicable UL standard. Um, of course, that is that is a step, but people can still um, buy devices in, in New Jersey or elsewhere in New York State. Um, many of you probably participated in the CPSC hearing over the summer on this topic. Um, New York City's Fire Commissioner and, and her team were there as well. Um, what I'm hearing about that session is there was such consensus that we need um, we need the feds to really step up and create a national standard. Um, but then I was a little deflated to hear how long and hard that might be to get there. So I wanted to put that question to this brain trust is um, what's the best way to get to um, mandatory safety standards. Um, I'm sort of assuming most people here are in favor of that. That's something that we um, are in favor of in New York City. Um, so yeah, what's what's our what are our best tactics to to um, either get to mandatory safety standards or or really just stem the the tide of the devices? Um, the de minimis loophole seems like one method of getting at this. Um, so this is sort of another way of looking at it. Um, how do we, how do we, um, yeah, create more certified devices in, in the states and, and keep out the, the unsafe devices? Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, Don. And we have four speakers on this, and uh, we already have a question in the chat, so this will be a very engaging conversation. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Eric Fredrickson, uh, Call to Recycle, for comment first. Thank you, Eric. Hi. Thanks, Heather. And it on an, another really important societal question to answer. I, I want to start by saying that the problem devices are not coming from the pe the, the manufacturers on this call. We, and, and, and I'm saying that as somebody who's not a product manufacturer, but I, I feel very confident in the, the design and the, the manufacturing standards of organizations like Alta and Trek and Shimano and others on this call, Bosch. The, the, these are not the bad actors that we're having to deal with, but we are collectively being tasked with helping to come up with the, the solutions for it. There's two different things that I think we need to address separately. The first is you can, a, a rider, a user, a member of the community can take a good battery, a good drivetrain system, and do things to it so that it is now a problem. So uh, we we all collectively have a role to play, and that's something that, um, that does start to fall on, you know, it's a public safety, but people need to learn and be educated on the fact that despite the fact that many things in the biking and riding world that you can take apart and tinker with and put back together and have them work just fine. That's not how e-bike systems work. And so we've seen a lot of problem behavior. I've talked to folks at FDNY who've engaged in problem, who've seen problem behavior, people swapping out cells, people Frankensteining bikes. I've seen you, you walk around in New York City and you see things that look like they came out of Mad Max and people are riding around on them and charging them in a multifamily dwelling. I don't know though when it becomes a, a problem such that there are seal and vacate orders listed at bad acting businesses that are doing things that are creating a public hazard. And I don't know at what point the city and other municipalities and jurisdictions have to get the collective will to make decisions that this is not a kerosene heater, that you can't just take it from somebody and then put it into inventory in Randall Island and have somebody come and pick it back up and then start using it again. So there have to be some teeth to what people are doing bad behavior wise to keep to, to when we're making good batteries 
into bad batteries. So I think it's important to acknowledge that that's a different issue from what gets solved by a de minimis. And it's a different issue that gets solved by a standard or by a label. Um, I, I think that the action that New York City has taken is a good first step. Um, but I think that we have a long way to go as far as um, ensuring that all of the products that are being sold meet those kinds of standards. Uh, um, there's been some action that was taken in the with hoverboards and there's precedent in other spaces, but it's a certain point there is a potential for a discussion of whether or not a retailer, a seller, or a reseller in a marketplace type of environment has some type of, of direct legal liability for selling something into the market that then becomes a public hazard. You know, this starts to become a, a, a legal question. Um, but at some point, the responsibility has to cascade away from the individual purchaser because it's unrealistic to say that you shouldn't buy something that appears to be legal to go out there and buy on a multi-vendor marketplace. Thank you so much, Eric, for your comments. We'll continue this conversation. Uh, Leo, like regulatory compliance director from SRAM, will chime in now. Um, Eric, thank you for uh, your uh, comment about the responsible manufacturers on the call. I agree with that. And again, thank you. Um, Ibrahim probably would not like me um, assigning a dollar figure of how much it costs responsible manufacturer to take the battery through the certification, uh, proper certification um, or e-bike certification for that matter. Uh, it's, it's a substantial amount of money and a crazy amount of time from manufacturer uh, to to do that. Um, when I go on Amazon, and right now I'm in Germany, and I actually try to type in uh, to go on Amazon, and it takes me to the German website, and there are no batteries in Germany that are, you know, for 300 or whatever, $400. Um, in the United States, it's very easy, and you can see that some of the batteries um, uh, come up from the same source, and there is like a 15, 20 different variation of that battery from the same source, different capacity, different sizes, different shapes. And with 100% certainty, I can tell you that those batteries are not certified because there is absolutely no way any manufacturer can afford to pay the amount of money required to certify one configuration and then multiply it by 15 or 20. They just not going to be able, it's not possible to to sustain that kind of business model. Um, so th that being said, um, the uh, what what's the way to deal with this? Um, uh, yes, I agree with Don that it was very deflating to hear from CPSC that they are not planning on doing anything on the federal level anytime soon, uh, if ever. Uh, they may try to do something, but um, it's gonna take a long time. I can tell you that I already seen the, the what's called a buzz in the industry that the orders of e-bikes uh, to New York City are just not going to be fulfilled. And I appreciate, Don, that you understand the fact that somebody in New York State or New Jersey or neighboring places can place an order for the e-bike and bring it to New York. Um, but... Um, Again, this is, this is the reality. And unless there is something done to actually mandate the certain level of uh, conformity, specifically for batteries, right? We, we all need to understand that the source of fire is, is the battery. Um, so unless we lobby local government, federal government, and plead them to mandate that, nothing's going to nothing's going to happen and for as long as companies like amazon alibaba uh, ebay are allowed to sell the inexpensive uncertified batteries this is this is going to be an ongoing issue thank you leo let's continue forward uh ibrahim juliana ul solutions 
So um, Heather, I'm going to I'm going to give a story about lithium ion batteries from the best of my knowledge. And I know George will speak as well after me, and he probably has more uh, in-depth knowledge than me. Uh, he definitely does. Um, my history is this. So I look at 2000 or let's say 1990s into 2000s, and you only had a laptop being the only product that had a lithium ion battery. And what did the laptop industry do right off the bat to make sure that they were not gonna have widespread issues or if there was an issue, was, it was isolated to specific uh, batches of the cells. Well, what they did was they ensured that they followed the workplace safety laws of the United States. And workplace safety laws of the United States, 29 CFR 1910 subpart S documents that uh, electrical equipment needs to be third party certified and it needs to be to the applicable uh, safety standard. Um, they did that knowing very well that number one, it was uh, a requirement for the workplace and that laptops were primarily being used in enterprise and workplace environments and they wanted to meet that requirement. But they also understood uh, that the cells and then the end products that they're going into have to work as a system. So you have a cell that becomes a battery pack, that battery pack then goes into a host device, that host device then becomes part of a, a charge, uh, gets connected to a charger and then everything becomes a system. Uh, so. Until today, you know, 20 plus years later, we're all working off great laptops that have lithium ion batteries, no issues. None of us ever think twice about uh, a laptop in our bag, uh, a tablet, and so on. From the laptop industry, then we started seeing other industries adopt lithium ion technologies, power tools, uh, tablets, and, and uh, smartphones, um, and then a whole slew of smaller industries like e vape equipment, power banks, and so on. When it went to smartphones and tablets, uh, the cellular carriers of the United States, uh, AT&T, T-Mobile, T Verizon, they put the same rules that OSHA put on uh, uh, workplace safety for electrical equipment. They put those rules on the cell phones. And they said that if a cell phone is going to sell in the United States, it must have demonstrated system safety. The host device, the charger, the battery pack, the battery cell, even though it's a single cell battery pack, they said all of that has to be uh, third party evaluated, tested and certified. You have to go through what they call a CTIA authorized test laboratory. Uh, those laboratories are run by the association directly. So as an association, they have their own laboratory program and qualification program. Uh, UL is a member of that program. And then and we have to submit every year uh, our qualifications as why we can offer up the certification service. And that's how cell phones get on the market then is because they demonstrate uh, that they can do that. Power tool industry, because they're used in the workplace, they also recognize that, you know what, we need to follow the OSHA rules, and they did that. Now, fast forward into what we're dealing with, with power banks, e-vape, and um, micromobility equipment. The only rule that really existed in those markets was the CPSC regulation. And CPSC regulation is non-existent. There has been no safety law ever from the Consumer Product Safety Commission or from lawmakers that said for consumer product safety, uh, dangerous good products like lithium ion battery operated products need to go through some uh, product evaluation, uh, testing and certification like you would do in a workplace environment, like you would do in a, in a cellular uh, phone environment. So I think the, the gap, Don, that, you know, that New York City closed uh, was the appropriate one that others have demonstrated, trade associations, as well as a federal regulator. And those examples should be brought forward uh, in more uh you know, more ways uh, to, to the commission as well as to lawmakers. But outside of those two entities, which like you said, may take a long time, uh, try to now get the national state uh, fire marshals, uh, state association of fire marshals, try to get the uh, international association, association of fire chiefs, international association of firefighters to, to sing in chorus with the FDNY and the New York city council to say, okay, this is what we're expecting that lithium battery operated product, whether it be micromobility or all the way down to an earbud, have the same level of scrutiny that you would have on a workplace product or on as what you would have on a cell phone product that's sold into the U.S. cellular network. And so those organizations would be the ones, I think, that could raise the awareness and also maybe set the uh, expectations in local municipalities to get the electrical inspectors, the building inspectors, and whoever is in a stakeholder capacity to, to look into this further while we see if any federal uh, uh, statutes would pass. Uh, we still have to do our part to educate that, you know, addressing product safety or addressing public safety can be done through product safety. Thank you so much for your comments, Ibrahim. This is a great topic. Uh, we have one more presenter today, um, George Kirchner, uh, the portable rechargeable 
uh, Battery Association will now present. Thank you, George. Hey, Heather, thanks very much. So just a point of, point of clarification, we are, um, we dropped the word portable from our name um, that about 15 years ago. We're just known as PRBA, the Rechargeable Battery Association. So a lot of our members are in the large format space as well. So the, if you're not familiar with PRBA, we've been around since 91, and we spend a lot of time uh, in the state legislative uh, area on battery collection and recycling legislation. And one thing that we've learned over the last 32 years is having a, a piece of model legislation that you can hand off to legislative staff who are looking into these into battery collection and recycling is really the way to go. We've Our association is pretty diverse. We've got battery manufacturers, product manufacturers, battery recyclers, uh, battery retailers, airlines, et cetera. It's a very diverse association. So trying to get the industry um, to rally around a particular piece of legislation was, was a lot of work and we've been able to do that. So what we've done, again, we've moved from being more reactive to proactive in the legislative space, for example, Washington DC, Washington State, and California over the last three years have passed battery EPR or battery collection and recycling legislation. And we were at the table when that legislation was written. And we did that because we have a very strong network of, of folks in the industry who work with the NGOs who draft who are interested in this EPR issue. And I, I think for this group, and I know it's a very diverse group and there's a lot of different interests um, on this webinar here, but if you, if you think about trying to get a piece of model legislation that we can all agree to, and I know that's gonna be extremely difficult, um, but having that in your back pocket and being proactive on this. So for example, if California, or we're certainly gonna expect New York to come back with legislation next year, but if this industry could form a coalition of different interests and have that model legislation and have the industry behind it, um, will really go a long way to get good legislation passed at the state level. And I think that's probably one of the quickest ways to get this, you know, issue moving forward and getting safer products onto the market. You're absolutely right. The federal approach is going to take some time. I'm confident CPSC is committed to this. Um, Congress needs to pass the, the Schumer bill, and that will all probably happen, but it is going to take a while. But if you can get California and New York, Illinois, and you know Washington, Texas, whatever, you, know, you get a half a dozen states that passes to pass this type of legislation, it by default is going to be a national standard. Um, and so I think that's the biggest challenge for this group here is to you know, see if we can come together as a coalition and get that legislation written and get to the state houses and promote that. And it's gonna be up to this group whether they wanna be proactive and go not start knocking on doors in different states or whether they want to um, react to proposed legislation that's being introduced. It's, it's, it's an area that I said, you know, we've spent a lot of time in and over time over the last, I would say five years, our position has changed. We've become more proactive on the EPR issues. We've been successful in getting Washington DC, Washington State and California to have legislation, which are now laws, generally consistent in terms of what the, the legislation required for recycling efficiency rates, convenience standards, recycling uh, or collection rates and outreach and education and so forth, and the size of the batteries that are covered. So. It's a work in progress. I realize this is a, a new group per se that's gotten together to address those issues, but I think that's something this group needs to think long and hard about um, and whether that's even achievable with the diverse interests that you've got here. So that's that's been our experience and, and that's just my uh, suggestion to this group is maybe have a little subcommittee that could form that, develop that legislation um, that you can then walk up and start you know, knocking on doors or offer to those staffers who know little or nothing about batteries or e-bikes and get to them before they put pen to paper. So that's, that's really what I wanted to share with the group. So thanks, Heather, appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, George. And I know that People for Bikes is doing some great work here. And the idea of this group coming together is to see if we can get aligned. Um, before I go to the questions, I see uh, Leo has his hand up and I would welcome comment from any other panel members as well on this important topic. Leo, I'll turn it to you. 
Uh, thank you. Um, just a little anecdote here. Uh, when I was traveling back home from DC and I live in Colorado, I was on the same airplane as a Colorado Senator. Um, he, I, I told him that I appreciate all the work he's doing and I just said that, you know, I will support him again in the next election. He said, obviously, thank you. And he started asking me why I'm in DC. So I told him about the reason I was in DC. And I said, hey, by the way, um, this is a pretty serious issue. Colorado just, uh, Isa passed or about to pass uh, one of the largest tax breaks for the e-bike purchasers uh, on, uh, with a certain level of income. And um, I said, hey, New York is having this problem and New York senators are driving to find a solution, maybe you support your colleagues from New York. And he said, Leo, I have no idea what you're talking about. So um, again, this was kind of interesting that I'm trying to explain to him, hey, there's this battery fire problem in New York, please help your colleagues. And he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, it's not a problem to me. So anyway, just um, to kind of second what George was saying, I think is just excellent comments. And uh, the more we can do as a as a group, get together and try to address it with uh, with our legislators, that just will help. Thank you, Leo. Uh, we do have a couple of questions in chat, um, and I'll welcome any panel members to respond. The first question reads: In a previous webinar, it had asserted that a UL certified system was a safe system. We have stated that to customers. Is that considered accurate? Uh, we'll let Jeff from Trek Bicycle respond. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. Um, I guess I would just really quickly reiterate what I what I said in front of the CPSC, um, which was that we do have existing standards now. Um, a lot of companies in the United States and globally are applying these standards. And I, I can't speak for everybody and the numbers are and the statistics are very difficult on e-bikes and e-mobility in general to, to all pull together. But I, I do know just from the standpoint of our products. And if you follow the safety standards, the products are pretty darn safe. And I don't think people, I, I know we talked a lot about fireboxes and firebags and a lot of this other stuff. And, and that definitely becomes an issue when you're talking about um, dealerships that have a hundred batteries surcharging or you have potentially damaged batteries that come in to be repaired and, and that type of thing. Those are really edge cases. I think at the end of the day that the standards we have do work and they can always be better. They can always be improved technology, understanding all of that stuff um, evolves and the standards and regulations should evolve with that. But this, I would continue to reiterate that, that what we're applying and those of us that are applying the standards are seeing safe products and seeing results. And that would be the number one thing that I'd recommend sort of going back through all these questions is that if you can ensure that your product is certified to a UL standard or to potentially a, the European standard EN15194, that's gonna go a long ways for you to feel comfortable that, that the product you have is safe. The other thing I would say is, you know, use the US market system to your advantage. If, if you buy a product from a company that's verifiably in the United States, has a presence in the United States, is part of the United States legal system, I can guarantee you that uh, you know tort laws and product liability laws are going to also push those companies to follow safety standards. So by making sure that your product's certified and making sure you can verify who the manufacturer of your product is, I think you're making the biggest steps you possibly can towards uh, your, your product safety, e-bike safety. Thank you, Jeff. I see two more comments, and then we'll um, move to the summary for today. Eric uh, from Call to Recycle. Thanks, Heather. So a lot of great points that Jeff made there. Um, I, I, regarding the actual question that was posed, I, I would say the proof is in the pudding. Go, go look at your electrical box. You know, Not that I'm advocating that somebody take the cover off an outlet, but if you were to take the cover off at the outlet and look, you're going to see marks on those products that indicate that they are manufactured to certified to tested to certain standards. So there is a reasonable expectation of superior performance that things are being built. Are there counterfeit products? Sure. Uh, right. But by and large, the proof is in the pudding. There's a reason that organizations like UL 
exist and CSA and others exist and why um, they're they're entirely based on trust. Um, Jeff brought up a really important point about verifying who you're doing business with, whose products you're selling, because that cascading liability has not yet gone through to the marketplaces that are selling products that are not listed, that are not certified, and are, as Jeff also said, those edge cases. Because at the end of the day, the edge cases is where the fires are happening. That's what's injuring people. It's, again, not the people on these calls. And the other thing that I would say about UL certification or any other type of certification is as soon as you start to swap out components, as, you, as soon as you start to mess with it, the user community, the rider community, you can no longer say that it is a certified and tested product. And so I'd really, really encourage that to be a strong takeaway for the retail community is to encourage their user and rider base and, and to evaluate very strongly what portions of a, of a traction system you will allow your shop to actually work on because you can take something that's certified and void it and then make a system that is now unsafe. Thank you, Eric. And last comment here from Leo. Leo, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I, I'll try to be super quick here. Uh, before joining SRAM eight, nine years ago or something like this, I spent 14 years at UL. I wrote many standards. I participated in many technical com committees. Uh, um, and I can tell you that, um, and, and UL 2849, which is the standard for the e-bikes, I was the uh, one of the people who published the first edition long, long time ago, and then participated in updating the standard and making uh, some improvements to it. Um, I can, to answer the question directly, and Ibrahim, again, apologize, you may not like my answer 100%, um, but I, I, by no means I say that we should not have e-bike or system standards, right? We, we should, they are important. Um, but to answer the question at hand, does the e-bike standard addresses the battery fire? No, e-bike standard references to the battery standards and the battery standards address the battery fire. Good battery design with proper BMS and then really good testing to the battery standards that is how we fight the battery fire. Now, again, by no means I'm saying we should not have the system standards. We should, because there's a whole bunch of other things at play that we should be addressing. Um, the, the, um, the importance here is to make sure that we're answering the, the problem and the question. And to answer that is to, to use battery standards. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Mike, we're really running short on time, but if you have a quick comment, I want to make sure you're allowed to, to throw it in there as well. It, it is a quick comment, Heather, and that's the fact that, you know, obviously the focus of the conversation has been on the batteries and the bikes and the systems and the integration and the testing and the certification, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that's only one part of the issue. The other part of the uh, issue is is proper education to our customers and dealers. Uh, I tried to make this point before CPSC back in July, and that's the fact that uh, even the best battery pack in the whole world will fail under the right circumstances, and those right circumstances can be misuse and abuse of the battery pack, using the wrong chargers, trying to charge a damaged battery that, that, that's otherwise been compromised and whatnot. But uh, we should applaud people for bikes in terms of developing a comprehensive user manual that uh, hopefully will be published and distributed soon. But the bottom line is, is education is a key part of this. I think we're seeing a bit of that uh, via the, the news uh, that, that comes out of New York City relative to the fires. I think people are beginning to have an appreciation that these battery packs must be properly maintained and used. So, but we as an industry need to make a concerted effort to train our users and our, and our dealers to the fact that uh, you know, this is a, a high energy storage medium and it is potentially dangerous if it's not properly uh, managed. So uh, that's got to be a big part of this effort to, to make sure that uh, uh, our systems are safe uh, in every dimension. Thank you very much, Mike. And thank you to everyone. This has been an excellent conversation and I really appreciate everyone bringing your opinions together. Uh, I'm going to turn it over now to Jay Townley, who's been taking notes throughout who is going to offer up a summary of some of the conversations that we've explored on the four topics and how we miss, might uh, move as a group and as an industry forward. 
Jay. Thank you, Heather, and thank you to all of the folks that have spoken uh, on the issues and also the folks that created the questions. First one up was de minimis. Um, and I think from the standpoint of the takeaway I've got from the conversation uh, is uh, exemption appears to be what uh, I heard from the law, law community and also from the lay people here. Uh, it's one that uh, Human Powered Solutions is familiar with and also the NBDA because there is an exemption now. Uh, liquor, by the way, folks, is exempt from the de minimis uh, exemption. And so uh, it is possible to do that, but also uh, relative to being large or small, um, I'm a former registered lobbyist for one company in the bike business. Uh, I know it can be done from experience. I know things have changed, but uh, I do think that uh, we as an industry uh, need to begin to look together with what People for Bikes has already taken as a position and what we can do uh, to create uh, a uh, if you will, a wave of support within the industry for uh, the exemption approach. Let's get uh, bicycles, e-bikes, and e-bike batteries, lithium-ion batteries uh, out of the uh, de minimis uh, struggle that's going on. Uh, the fashion houses are behind a lot of this, and I know that um, what's been published lately is Shen is one um, of the entities that spent more than $800 million per month lobbying this issue. We can't meet that, but we can also get what we need across. So what I'm getting from the, the summary and adding a little personal comment to it is uh, that uh, we need to make sure as a group that we uh, begin to support or bring support to what People for Bikes is already asking for, which is to exempt micromobility products, which seems to be a consensus. Um, I also agree, by the way, write those letters. Um, we can be very effective in talking to the local uh, representatives, members of the House of Representatives from our states that we know, the senators we know, uh, write those cards and letters um, and let's get our message across on the de minimis side. Now it's just Heather that uh, perhaps we can start a circular letter for this group on that uh, subject and see what we can do to combine that with what's happening with people for bikes. Um, item number two, uh, the three class system. Um, I think that that uh, what I'm getting out of this uh, is a number of things, but education now will be a theme throughout the next three pieces. Uh, educating consumers, educating the trade, education all the way through the, the process here, because uh, I do think that it was pointed out that the three class system was developed by a trade association for use. And we also have to take into account that uh, it was not uh, intended for product. Now for product, what I didn't hear mentioned in the conversation and should have been, is there is a current definition of bicycle that is in the CPSC reg. It's part of 16 CFR uh, 4210. Uh, and essentially it uh, encompasses uh, what they view as e-bikes. So I think that uh, number one, we begin to give more visibility to what's already in the mandatory federal reg which is e-bikes. They are included in the definition. Uh, we could talk about you know, how you regulate and all the, the needs for regulation separately, but simply the education about the fact that there is a definition for e-bikes that goes to the use side of the discussion. Um, and uh, then also turn our attention uh, to uh, how we apply that definition to our products. I think here again, uh, if we can make a statement as a group that perhaps, uh, Heather, we could put together a policy statement relative to this issue um, and uh, circulate that to this panel in the course of the next month or so, so that we get to the next meeting. Uh, we've got some proactive agreement here on uh, both what needs to be done from the use standpoint and also from the product standpoint, starting with the fact that there is a federal definition and then you've got, uh, and with Larry's the expert on this, we've got people and people for uh, a people for bikes organization uh, that can certainly help us frame what are the use requirements that fall within the right now, uh, the, the three class definition. Number two, um, Don, I think we owe you at this point um, uh, a protocol, a set of protocols. From what I got out of the conversation, um, and uh, fully agree with what we 
wound into and, and where we ended up at the end. And that is we started out talking about multifamily dwellings and then uh, soon worked our way into bike shops. And the, the, the question here really is multiple uh, housing, apartment buildings, condominiums, the kinds of structures that they've got in the New York's, the, the Chicago's, the large cities. But uh, we, uh, at this point, as a group, uh, have not, to my knowledge, pro uh, provided a set of protocols, at least uh, to put together what would be the recommendations. So here again, Heather, I would suggest that perhaps Mike and I, Mike Fritz and I, take lead, prepare for you a protocol draft uh, for advice that uh, we could start with the NBDA or this, this panel group can um, have Dawn take a look at, see how it fits into the New York situation. We begin to look at advice to give to the condominium associations, to the building uh, owners relative to uh, protocols for multifamily dwellings relative to, do they allow uh, e-bikes into the building? Uh, are e-bikes allowed into the building for charging? Under what conditions, under what circumstances? Uh, I'm not suggesting that we allow that or promote that, but that we cover that in the protocols and provide those protocols to uh, Dawn to take a look at. And if they pass muster, then we've got a starting point to go to these communities, uh, or I'm sorry, to these uh, condominium owners and to the, to the large building owners. Uh, the objective here is not to have them banning uh, e-bikes, but to find a way we can accommodate them. So, uh, Mike, if you're up for it, when you get back from uh, uh, from uh, Asia, I think probably we, uh, the recommendation we put together a, a draft protocol for Heather to circulate to this group to look at, to add to, to adjust, to amend, and then get it to Dawn for uh, her to take a look at to see if it, uh, it's useful from the standpoint of the city of New York. Last item, uh, great conversation relative to uh, how do we get a mandatory regulation through? And I think without belaboring this point, uh, I heard again repeated uh, education, education, making sure we're educating. Uh, a mandatory reg at this point is going to take time. And so we're going to need to fall back on what's already written, what's already available. Many people on the panel have already been a part of that. It's essentially two things. It's UL 2849. And UL 2271, if I've got that number correct for the for the battery, um, I don't think you exclude either. I think this is a systems issue that's inclusive of the battery. And in turn, um, we as a group, back to let's put together a position paper to be proactive. Uh, for those of us that were uh, present on July 27 at the CPSC headquarters for the testimony, at the end of the day, the chairman and or one of the sitting commissioners asked a question of the panel, the panel that was on as to how much harmonization is there between the mandatory standards for mechanicals for bicycles in Europe and also for uh, the standards, both voluntary and mandatory that exist for lithium ion battery systems and micro mobility. The answer that came out, whether disputed or not was 80%. So in other words, like it or no, there's about 80% harmonization between what exists as up-to-date current standards for bicycles and up-to-date current standards, voluntary or otherwise, for uh, e-bikes and for e-bike batteries. So uh, I think uh, I, liked, I liked the comment about model legislation, George, um, and I think that's very much uh, uh, in, to, to benefit us is very much in the future. So we don't have time to write that, Heather, in the course of uh, the next uh, quarter, but I do think we could put together a proposal that goes to first the issues of what do we do in the meantime? How do we put that letter together that George referred to? What is the model legislation we work with the whole industry to create, to put in place because there is at least 80% harmonization and uh, identify the key factors? so that uh, all of the groups can come together and hopefully begin to put forward the general proposition that we can be proactive with a, perhaps uh, a voluntary industry standard that is inclusive of what's already in place and create that as a means of bridging the gap until we can see a mandatory federal reg in place. So that's my summary. Excellent, Jay, thank you. 
And again, this is the first of uh, a quarterly opportunity that we'll have to get together. Um, before we move forward to adjourn today, I do know Don Miller has one other uh, item to address the panel with. So Don, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to extend an invitation from the city of New York. Uh, my, my colleagues, um, John Cassidy and, and Daniel Murray from our, the fire department are organizing a full day event in New York City on October 12th. Um, it will be a discussion um, between public safety experts, the insurance industry and other stakeholders. I think this group would be um, amazing set of expertise to bring. The goals are to educate the insurance industry about um, the, the risks um, to discuss how we can work together to reduce risks and incentivize and encourage um, safe practices um, when it comes to um, the sales and storage of electric micromobility devices. Um, we'll have a registration um, website um, expected to be live by the end of the week. So maybe I can work with Heather to get that to all of you. Um, we would really value um, this group's expertise if anyone is able to join and and really provide um, that perspective in this in this conversation. Um, the insurance industry is going to be a big part in how this all goes down. And so I'm, I'm really excited. My colleagues at the fire department are starting that conversation. Thank you, Don. We will make sure to work with you to circulate that. And thank you, Larry. I just saw the note in chat as well um, about the education uh, aids that People for Bikes released this week. Uh, yeah, thank you everyone for attending today, for the excellent questions, for everyone's opinions added to the conversation, and Jay for the summary. A recording of this forum will be available on our YouTube channel within 24 hours. Our next forum is set for Tuesday, December 12th, and we'll begin soliciting items for that agenda two weeks prior. We will work to publish a release summarizing the conversation today and some action items. Uh, reach out to me at any time with feedback, questions, um, heather at mbda.com. And let this be the first of positive change. And with this, I'll adjourn today. Thank you every everyone very much. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, Heather.